How can we grow in holiness through relationships? How can we heal our wounds through psychology and the graces of the sacraments? Up next, we'll be talking with Dr. Gregor Bataro, an expert on Catholic psychology, and we'll be learning about this and more. Stay tuned. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are your co-hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. We're blessed that you are here, and we're actually blessed to be here, too, to talk about some great things today with Dr. Greg. Before we get to Dr. Greg, we just wanted to mention, um, if this is your first time following us, please click that subscribe button on whichever podcast player you're listening to. If you're on YouTube, definitely click that subscribe button, that bell button. We come out with these uh, weekly, all aimed and geared at helping men grow in holiness and that ongoing formation. We're so blessed for our listeners and blessed for our donors that make this possible. If you are um, able and capable and you're discerning um, donating to us, we'd love your assistance and your support. Head over to um, patreon.com slash Catholic gentlemen. You can see the different tiers that we offer. So as Sam was suggesting in the teaser, we are blessed to be joined today with uh, Dr. Greg. He is a Catholic psychologist. He is the director, and he started the Catholic Psych Institute 12 years ago. He's also recently launched a new uh, certification program that's called the Catholic Integrated Accompaniment or Mentorship uh, to help individuals understand this integrated life. He's married for 10 years. He's got his seventh child on the way. Praise be to God. Lives and practices in Connecticut. Again, blessed to have you here, Dr. Greg. How are you doing? Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really, uh, really excited to be here with you guys. Yeah, we appreciate it. And Sam and I had talked about you and having you on the show probably a year ago when we were creating lists. So we're great that uh, you're, you were willing and, and able to join us uh, today. We It's something very close to both of our hearts, this idea of mental health in general. Um, we live in a wounded society. And so just having more and more uh trained and uh, experienced and devout Catholic psychologist on the show is, is real important to us. So yeah, it's so, so many pressing needs. And I think especially when you have a focus on men and, and what men are looking for, what men need, it's it's really tough not to crack here for for whatever reason. You know, we have our theories, but men don't seem to necessarily gravitate <laughs> towards mental health conversations. And uh, so I really, really love the opportunity here to to sit with you guys and part of your audience, you know, and and share what we can here. Agreed. And I would love to actually start with that is that so many individuals today in the church, people that Sam and I have met are really kind of just a, against psychology in general. They they have this tendency to believe that it was all formed um, and shaped uh, outside of the truths and teachings and authentic teachings of, of the church, you know, us as um, individuals created in the Imago Dei. And they also have a tendency to believe that um, you can solve all your problems and your issues by, you know, praying the rosary more and going to confession more and in and, and just strictly, you know, kind of spiritualizing and growing in holiness. Now, we both pray the rosary daily. We're all about going to confession frequently. Um, but what would you say to individuals that um, compartmentalize psychology and psychiatrists and mental health into like this modern bucket that we as devout Catholics shouldn't approach because obviously you're doing just the opposite and, and, you know, having such great strides and and advancements. So, so. yeah, I, I, you know, I like to start off at least with a place of understanding and really, really just voice, uh, you know, validation of, of the, the fear or the hesitation or the being on guard against ways that secular psychology has totally warped the human person. And, and there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical for what might come from this radically postmodern, relativistic, anti-religious field. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, that's step one. It's like, yeah, I get it. Like that's, I, I agree with, with a lot of, of what people are saying. And then to say, you know, but, but, you know, if we're Catholic, we really should be people of the both and just really looking for the deeper points of complexity, of integration, of of being open to how truth is universal and 
that means that it's not in a bucket and it's not in a compartment. So we should be able to see threads of arrays of truth in, in many perspectives. Um, and, and so, you know, we want to look at how the science of psychology appropriately applied leads us to the same truth. If there's a unity of universal truth, that revelation would lead us to, and mm. there's a place for it. And this is our faith that there is a place for the sciences. This is the history and tradition of our church. This is the magisterial teaching of our church. This has always been a Catholic position that we are not only open, but supportive of and, and validating of and in need of science as a manifestation of human intelligence and the creativity that God gave us to explore our world and to understand it. So uh, there's something very limited and lacking in a, a broad stroke disavowal or disregard of, of psychology. And, and so, yeah, I think we want to see both, both sides of that there. Yeah. I, I think uh, a lot of people associate modern psychology with, you know, Freud who, you know, who is, was very uh, anti-religious um, and just saw it as just, you know, some projection of, of, you know, unmet childhood needs or something like that. Um, and yet, um, Freud isn't isn't the only voice, and there are some things that that are able to be learned um, from from some people who've taken the science of psychology seriously. Um, but before we get there, and I do want to hear kind of some of the influences on you and what who've shaped you as a psychologist, because I think that's important. But before we get there, I'm curious, like, can you give your definition, or I should say? the the you know catholic definition not yours specifically of what we're even talking about when we talk about the psyche or the mind or this or or this whole domain that we're exploring in the realm of psychology because i think it gets a little fuzzy sometimes people are like well you know i believe in the body and i believe in the soul and i just don't really believe in this thing called the the psyche or the mind or, or whatever you want to call <laughs> right. it the unconscious and and there's just kind of this skepticism around like, what are we even exploring here? Like, what is this, you know? Um, and, and so I'd love to hear your definition of, of what we're talking about when we talk about the field of psychology. Sure, yeah, great question. And, and uh, I'm actually neck deep in this right now because I'm, uh, we're, we just launched a certification. So I'm teaching a course on the anthropology of John Paul II. And uh, St. John Paul II which is not the all-encompassing end-all be-all of what is Catholic, but I think we could we can reliably look to John Paul II for a good sense of of a Catholic perspective. Um, he he wrote a book called Person and Act, and this is a huge tome of philosophical anthropology unpacking the person. And he gives a blueprint, which which I believe, and why we're teaching it in our certification, should be. The, the foundation for all Catholic mental health. And his anthropology, he gives a, a picture of a human person. He says, this is the composite. So we have church teaching, Christ reveals man to himself and makes his divine calling clear. Like Jesus Christ is the quintessential human. He tells us how to be human. He shows us how to be human. But it's one sentence in a church document that requires probably decades of unpacking. How does Jesus reveal man to himself? So John Paul II has unpacked what that might look like. And he's created a blueprint to say, this is the human person. And what he says is that we have different dimensions that overlay the material biological part of us and the transcendent spiritual part of us. So there's the, the body and spirit, but they overlap each other. They're not two distinct things. We are one person. There's a unity of personhood that can be understood through this overlay of the biological material and the spiritual. And so he has different dimensions in this blueprint. And he has, so he says there's what he calls the somatovegetative, which is like the, the body processes of blood and heartbeats and pressure and, and sensory tactile, different things. Then he has what's called the psychoemotive which is the way that the brain processes incoming sensory data from the body and then processes it to, uh, to create thoughts. Then he has the cognitive faculties of the person. 
And then he has a whole different dimension of what he calls consciousness. And there's different parts of consciousness as well. So, and, and then all of this leads towards self-knowledge. And then we also have what he says, and he actually brings Freud up in person in act. Mm. And he says that we've learned from the sciences that there is this realm of the subconscious. And he talks about the subconscious and he gives great reference to this. And in fact, he gives us an entirely beautiful, different perspective on the human story of what a person's journey is. And he says that a person's history is written in the interplay between their subconscious and conscious awareness. So this is like the work of accompaniment. What we know, what you know very well is like you're walking with somebody and it's like, Am I talking to this 45-year-old or am I talking to a 12-year-old right now? Mm -hmm. Because the way he just looked at me and reacted, it felt like I was in the room with a 12-year-old. Well, maybe you were. Maybe there's a part of this 45-year-old that's still acting, feeling, and thinking like he learned how to when something bad happened to him when he was 12. He's not actually a 12-year-old, but that part of him that emerged at that point in his life is very much present and real. Mm -hmm. And we cannot be so myopic and disintegrated to think this is only a 45 year old. What happened to the 44 year old? Did that person like disappear from the face of the planet when the person turned 45? Of course not. We're not moving from one state to the next. It's like rings of a tree. When you cut the tree and you see the rings and the stump and, and we're made of all of these rings of all of our experience of all this time. We're, we're not holding all of that in conscious awareness at all times, but it is very much a very real part of who we are. So this is what John Paul II says lives, most of us lives in this realm of the subconscious. And in order to become human, fully human, in order to have what he calls a human act, it is to be self-aware with self-determination and freedom and agency. That means we have to have what is locked in our subconscious brought to the light of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he says that this is a direct quote from John Paul II. He says it is one of the important tasks of morality and education to bring that which is in the subconscious to the light of conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing that ever validated our profession more than it's like, this is it. John Paul II just said, this is one of the most important tasks of morality and education that we can, that we can help people move the things locked into the, into the place of their subconscious, into their conscious mind. So yes. they can make free decisions and act like real humans, not just animals acting on impulses or acting out of unconscious repression and defense mechanisms, but, but with full awareness of, of our, our real freedom. I don't know if that's an answer to your question or oh, not. Yeah. But, no, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> and, and this, I mean, I mean, uh, I know there's, there's different thoughts about him, but, but, you know, that's, that's a lot of what Carl Jung talked about is about, you know, bringing, bringing these unconscious absolutely. forces that control you and the more unconscious they are, the more power they have over you. Exactly. But the more conscious they are, the more you have freedom and determination to make those choices. And then, you know, this, this idea of different parts of us frozen at different ages, you know, I, I the therapy I work the most with is internal family systems. And it's all about exactly. working with these different parts that kind of make up our personality, our mind, like a stained glass window, you know, all these different colors that make up uh, the stained glass window. It's kind of like these different parts of us that make up our minds and, and we work with those we, and we bring them into the light of conscious awareness and then, and then healing can happen. Um, but that was a beautiful explanation. I, and, and that, and uh, uh, that's in really incredible the depth to which um, Pope John Paul II went um, in exploring the different dimensions of the human person and, and the, 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 just the incredible engagement that he had with, with some of these, these psychological uh, insights as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's profound. We really, I think we, we need have a long way to go to really appreciate what he's contributed to humanity and, and unpacking his, his brilliance. So yeah, it's, it's a huge project, but it's, it's worth undertaking. Yeah. Amen. No, I very much agree. And it is, it's just, um, hearing those stories and these, I, I haven't read that book, uh, of his, but I do, I'm just always in awe 
um, with uh, his writings and the the galactic intellect that he was, and and not not a not a trained psychologist or anything, but just a man who just probed the depths and had such a, a great intelligence. So I appreciate you sharing that with us as well. But mm -hmm. something that I was thinking about as you were talking was just the importance of understanding this uh, for relationships. So I know a lot of our listeners have alcoholic parents, you know, um, uh, you know, as an example, and and when um, there's a book out that um uh, what was it like basically uh, your your parents are uh, um haven't grown up you know and and there's this um how to handle um a, a a child for a parent because because of this alcoholic tendencies but i guess the, the what i'm getting at and and what i'm hearing and what i'd like you to talk more about is just that nature of how how this understanding helps us um communicate more effectively with uh, other men and women in our lives. And I'd love you to, to talk a little bit more about that is that, you know, kind of unfolding the, the onions or the layers of the human psyche and the human person uh, does just that, helps us appreciate, helps us that both and so that we can um, better relate and better communicate with others. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's a couple layers where, where it helps us. I mean, number one, when we're in an engagement of any kind, we can we can sort of wonder about what it means to us to be having this kind of engagement. So, you know, a very common example is is just conflict itself. Mm. You know, if there's tension or if there's an argument or a fight or something is happening and it's like, what does that mean to you? You know, if your parents are divorced, that may mean something very different than having parents who were married 40 years and got through thick and thin and mm. gave you that example. And and maybe, so for you, a conflict is uh, kind of just run of the mill normal. This is what to be, what's to be expected. Whereas for somebody with divorced parents, the, the hint of conflict equals emotional disaster mm. and, and wreckage. And so the first step is to say, what, what does this exactly mean for me that this is happening right now? Um, and it could be it could be good things. It could be celebrations. It could be, you know, people who feel some people feel that, you know, nothing good happens. No good deed is unpunished. And, you know, nothing good happens without the other shoe dropping eventually. So these kinds of narratives that we're taught that we learn from the, our life, from the world around us, from our parents, from family of origin, whatever. We start to look at like what's happening in the, under the surface, and and again that un, subconscious narrative that's occurring underneath that we're not really listening to in the moment or communicating from in the moment, but it's happening nonetheless. So then, and then you take another look and you say, okay, well, maybe you do some work and you realize actually every relationship should have conflict, and if it does, there's no conflict in a relationship, then you're not really in a relationship, hate to break it to you, but that's, that's what it comes down to. So then you accept that you do that work, you get to that. And then the next step is like, all right, so how am I communicating my needs or my perspective in this relationship? Or how am I learning how to listen to the other person and really understand empathy in this relationship? And there's again, more narratives, you know, if I, if I really try to understand your perspective that means I'm going to have to give in because both of us can't have a perspective. Maybe that's what you've been taught. You're either right or you're wrong. And, and if you were a kid who was always slammed for you, you don't see it the right way, then that's your narrative. So now you're of course going to bring that into your relationships moving forward. So these are all the ways that the, the more self-awareness we have, this is the, this is the thing, good Catholic therapy anyway, not all psychology, but good Catholic therapy will say our, our job is not to take away suffering. Our job is to show you the path to freedom and peace. And that may remove some suffering along the way, but it's certainly never proposed that we're going to remove all suffering. And it's not even really our intention. But if you can see what you're doing and why you're doing it, you have more freedom to make that choice to stop doing it. And, and or to do the right thing instead. And so that's what we're trying to do is help people become more self-aware, have more clarity in what these narratives are, more clarity on what they're holding in their subconscious, what they might be blocking themselves from, from really becoming aware of. So 
So that's that's where any way, any step in our life, any place in our, any relationship, any job, any endeavor can only be enhanced by having greater self-awareness. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's um, something we could all benefit from. And yet I do, I'm hearing uh, the complaint perhaps that if I start to open this door to all of these things inside, one, I might get completely overwhelmed by that. Number two, you know, I might just get lost in the weeds of like, how do I know what's real and what isn't? Like, how do I know this is like a narrative from my past as opposed to something real? Maybe I'll end up hating my parents and like, you know, resenting them in some way. And there's just like, you know, as I've talked to different people about psychology and things, that is something that comes up where there's a lot of fears around what might be inside and, and, you know, Hey, I've, I've gotten through life this far. Okay. You know, I've, I've kind of muscled through and, and I don't, I don't really need to open all that up because that could just be a real mess. You know, like how would you respond to someone who's feeling some of that apprehension? Yeah. I mean, again, same thing from the beginning of the show, mm-hmm. I would really validate that fear and, and a perspective and, and just really give reverence for that. You know, I think, there's a part of us that are really self-protective for a really good reason. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say, you know, it's good to have somebody to walk with, to open these things up that has some training and expertise and some, some ability to hold the difficulties that may come up with you. And I would say to answer some more of the specific uh, complaints or fears that you gave voice to, you know, number one, it's not really about your parents. It's not really about, you know, the the sort of quote unquote, what's true. It's about how you've interpreted and felt and carried these things inside of you. So I have, I have somebody that I work with that I've worked with for a number of years. And I, I know the family of this person and uh, there's a lot of love, you know, and, and, but we've come uh, to uncover some, some of the narratives that are influencing some of the more recent decisions that are being made. And it was, it kind of came to light. It's like, it seems like there's, you're trying to prove your worth to one of your parents here. And, you know, that was the sort of tone of the initial conversation. But then it was very clear right off the bat because this person actually talked to the parent involved, like immediately had the conversation about it. It's like, well, clearly, if you can have a quick conversation with the parent about it, like the parent's not the problem. Mm-hmm. necessarily per se it's and there's miscommunication so it's it's probably a little both and it's probably maybe on both person's parts whatever but the point is it doesn't actually matter if if the parent actually did something or didn't do something if there's real you know rejection or abandonment or this or that or if that's what it felt like for whatever reason for for this person as a little kiddo you know, and then carrying a story along their their life and building this up, and then now you're that's what you have to deal with. So you know, people say that all the time. It's like, oh, you're not just going to tell me it's my parents' fault, and I have to hate my parents now and all this stuff. It's like, well, first of all, all of us parents are at fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we're screwing up every day. So yeah. if you think we're getting out of this without imperfect parents, that's definitely not possible. Um, and so we want to look at how we've mislearned or been miseducated in what love is and who we're called to become the school the family is called the school of love and we've all received some level of miseducation so we have to spend our lives growing in holiness and conversion that means being corrected in the miseducation and the love that we've learned yeah yeah no i i'm so many great ideas and topics uh, uh, to go down. And actually, while you're bringing up family, I just think uh, that I'd like to go into a different dimension here within this this uh, conversation of relationship. And that's the 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 relationship between masculinity and femininity. And I'm just hearing that. Um, I think a lot of our listeners can relate to this. Us us three here on the, the call are all married men um, where we find ourselves uh, stating something that is being interpreted um, different by our spouse, by uh, by the woman in our lives, right? We state an observable fact 
um, and it's received as a uh, sense of judgment or a um, opinion or a directive on what they need to be doing better. And um, and I, anyways, just hearing you talk about family, I, I that was spurred in my thoughts and, and hopefully you don't mind me going in this direction, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, masculine and femininity and what both uh, uh, sexes have to um, have to offer when it comes to um, a healthy relationship among among individuals and um, primarily men uh, listening to the call. So, you know, maybe we can instruct them as, and myself included as well. Well, there's so many different directions yeah. to take this, but it's, I mean, really, it's a whole course of our certification. We're looking and we look at the brain, the brain differences between men and women and Ooh. then show how the body makes visible the invisible. So if we look at the brain, we can see something about gender that's important for difference and for complementarity, really. All, and this is, how do we sum this up really quickly? For well, let's podcast? start there with the brain. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love, because I mean, honestly, we we immediately think of, of biology as like the physical, that which we can, you know, see with our eyes, you know, and we all kind of um, see those obvious uh, examples, right? The feminine body versus the male body. But yeah, talk a little bit about the neural pathways and, the, you know, the difference between the the sexes there. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, so it's it's interesting in 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 utero, all brains, all all babies start off with moving towards the the formation of a female of being a female, and the X chromosome has an inhibit inhibiting factor that at, at a certain number of weeks, it actually limits uh, the progression of that female development, and then it turns things towards the male. So we they're very very different branches that that begin right from a few weeks of of um conception and so part of that is very fundamental basics as you have i mean this is probably common knowledge but it's you know men have more testosterone and the testosterone it's not just this like weird chemical it's it's part of the formation of all sorts of body structure f- physiology and behavior and patterns in thinking and feeling and then women have more estrogen and progesterone that are active in their brain formation and development. And so all the different neural pathways that end up developing are because this has been branched off from, from just a few weeks of conception. Mm-hmm. And that changes entirely the way that a brain works and perceives and then and 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 relates to environment, especially other people. So we have the effect of estrogen and progesterone or testosterone right off the bat. And then, you know, this is where we have boys growing with a tremendous amount of, of aggression and separation and, and women growing with a lot more connection and nurturance. And we have John Paul II talks about this, the, the, you know, what he calls what's called the feminine genius. And I also talk about the masculine genius. These are, these are meant to be complementarity oriented so it's it's not meant to be like oh we're just different like now that's the battle right we have to at least just prove that there's a difference but like that's so far behind of where we need Mm. to be it's like yes we're different and also there's a reason so Mm. let's talk about why why are we different and it's not just to make a baby it's because our whole personality is formed in this complementarity and so we have the feminine genius really simply put is a turning inward and the masculine genius is a turning outward and that's because uh, turning inward or outward in specific uh, relationship to a new baby a new person uh so so god made man and woman to come mm-hmm. together to make another person and to be fruitful and multiply so that new person is inside the be- the baby uh, body of the woman and outside the body of the man so the feminine genius is an orientation towards making persons inside of a person. And the masculine genius is oriented towards making persons outside of the person. And this is why a man has this this natural biological disposition to um, provide and protect because he's out scanning the horizon. He's like, where's the threat coming in? And then also, how do I go get like food and, and supplies and bring it in here to this internal unit? Meanwhile, woman is like I'm making a baby inside of my body right now. So like take care of all that outside stuff. Like I'm doing the most important thing here on the inside and she's oriented towards persons. And so this is literally in the brain. She has, I mean, there's so many different dimensions to this, but there's 
you know, the way that she, her mirror neurons work, the way that her anxiety systems work, the way that her cortisol, like for, here's a perfect example, age old stereotypical scenario. Woman has a problem. Man listens to the problem. Man rushes past the problem to the solution and wants to fix it. Woman yes. feels <laughs> misheard, not heard, disregarded. And now the man is like dumbfounded that he's got an answer and solution to her problem. And she's actually more hurt than when she started. Like, how did this happen? Yeah. So what happens is something called the mirror neuron system and the temporal parietal junction, the TPJ. And this is a part of the brain that is activated by a man. So the mirror neuron system means that I have parts of my brain that know what is happening inside of you because I can see what's happening. And it's almost like neuron to neuron is like mirroring each other. And so I see a look of pain on your face and I know you feel pain. I can almost feel pain if I really pay attention to what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. That's the mirror neuron system. Now for women, women have an, uh, an increase of cortisol with distress. And then through connection, through having another woman, for instance, give her that look. If that pain is felt by another person, it actually reduces the cortisol in the woman's brain in the first place. Now, if a man sees pain in somebody's face, or if a man feels pain and that pain is reflected back to them, that does nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and so what reduces the cortisol in a man's brain? So coming up with a solution, coming like as, uh, abstract reasoning, and then working through to a, a solution to the problem, fixing the problem. And this is actually what literally reduces the cortisol in the man's brain and gives a, a relief of stress from that distress. So you have a woman who is feeling the pain. The man sees that, but his, his response to fix it is not to sit in the empathy, but instead to rush ahead to the solution because that's how he knows how to fix problems. Now, to the woman, that feels like the opposite of a solution. But this is what I always tell women. Men don't care about other people's problems. <laughs> like we actually don't care about most people's problems biologically. In order for your, your husband or that man in your life to want to offer a solution, it means that his mirror neuron network actually was activated because he cares about you in particular and your problems matter to him. And then it triggers his brain to act towards fixing that solution. Just like if you were sitting with a girlfriend, she would want to listen more, ask questions, give empathy, understand. That's her way of relieving that cortisol boost. Whereas the man's way is different. So the problem is not that the man doesn't care about her. The problem is that there's no communication about what's really happening between these two very different kinds of humans. And God made us very different to force us to come together and listen and understand and communicate and actually become better versions of ourselves by, in that sense, dying to self and actually growing from this experience of another kind of human that's very different from myself. And that's how we actually become saints. That's why marriage is the primordial vocation sacrament to, as a vocation to holiness, because we have to work these things out. I was actually talking to somebody recently. It's like marriage prep should not be this hard. Mm -hmm. It's like the most, it's the primordial sacrament. It's the sacrament before the incarnation, before Christ. Like God made this thing so dumped down easy that he literally said every human can do it. There's only one thing mm -hmm. necessary. Just stay together. Mm -hmm. Till death do you part. It's that simple. Why? Because he knows. Doesn't matter if it takes 20 years, if it takes 40 years, if it takes 60 years, you guys will eventually get figure it out. If you just hang in there. And it's the it's the ruptures, it's the conflict, it's the tension that creates the need for the conversation, the communication that will eventually give life to solutions that can emerge. So if, if we actually just hang in there and stick it out, 
That's why it's the furnace that is the refiner's fire. That's how it ends up producing saints. But but we don't have any sense of a, 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 a longevity or long suffering or commitment as the most important thing for for even marriage prep. It's yeah. about oh, how do you feel? How do you know each other's love languages? And you should you should feel good and meet each other's needs. And this is how you can talk about finances. And this is how you can, you know, make sure you're on the same page for raising kids and all stuff. And like a hundred other things that is totally impossible to ever actually anticipate the real life circumstances of marriage as it unfolds. Meanwhile, the one single most important thing is not talked about. I Like marriage prep doesn't need to be more than a day retreat. It should be eight hours of repeating over and over again, till death do you part, till death do you part, till death do you part, till death do you part. <laughs> you could do it for three days if you want to, but it's going to be one point. And that's, but if we, if we don't get that, then we don't go through the furnace. We don't work out the problems and then all this other stuff gets lost along the way. So anyways, again, another really long answer to it. No. It's very powerful. Some great statements there. I really appreciate yeah. it. I'm glad that we're recording this so I can listen to it again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I love that. I mean, I think uh, like one way to summarize that, I mean, like marriage teaches you how to be married. Like, as you just, yes. like, you know, like, it, it, and, and, and I think, you know, in the modern world, part of the problem is like, we always feel like we have a choice. Like there's no, there's no sense of duty or commitment. It's always right. Pretty much everything, whether from faith to what you eat for breakfast is, you know, you've got unlimited choices. And when people bring that mentality to marriage where it's like, well, this is getting really uncomfortable. It's getting really hard. Like I always have the choice to leave. It's always in the back of my mind. Right. And, and that just torpedoes the whole growth process that could otherwise unfold. But I, I, I do want to, I want to do want to ask about communication because I think at least in my experience, this can be one of the biggest sticking points for couples. Like you mm -hmm. mentioned this profound differences between male and female and the ways of different yes. of seeing things. And so often that, that gets lost in translation. Like we're, we're actually, like John said, we're like actually trying to help and we end up making things worse. Or like we're trying to express care or uh, concern and we end up you know, making them feel unheard, unseen, uncared about. And that can be really distressing for a lot of people. I think it's it's something that can be a real cross for people as they're they're struggling to be a good husband, specifically, specifically talking to men. You know, they want to be that good husband. They want to be that rock that that she can always turn to or whatever. And yet they just don't know how to communicate themselves. And it can lead to to anger and other things where where people just um, don't know what to do with that. And so, so while we, we realize that the ultimate key is just sticking it out and longevity and letting that process unfold in the short term, like what can people do to better express themselves or better bridge that gap between the two worlds that is male and female and, and, and help things not, not get so lost in translation sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think just basics, there's some resources that are helpful. Uh, you know, I think there's some books that people can read to try to understand the way that the other person feels and thinks. And it's it's really profound how different the opposite sex really feels and thinks. And even reading more about it, even thinking more about the implications of the biophysiology and the ne neurology, it's like it, you take for granted what you feel even your sort of, you know, sensory perception and proprioception and like the feeling of what it's like to sit in a room. Like we have the sense of like, as men, I know that the two of you sitting in your rooms, you feel a certain sense. Mm -hmm. It's like you're in a room and you have these walls around you and you feel what I feel. And I know the brain structures that make you feel that feeling and create that sense for you. And I know that it's the same as mine. And the blood flow and the patterns of electrical activity, all these things. Women's are different. Mm -hmm. And we take it for granted that everybody must feel the same feeling for sitting in a room. But actually, because women are built to be a room, 
when they're in a room, they don't feel the same thing that we do. Because again, even their brains are built to be the type of, of bodies that can have bodies inside of them. So our whole sense experience is actually very different. Forget about communication. That's like advanced differences. Like just the basics of what a feeling feels like is, is very different. So there are books to read that, you know, talk about the male, female brain. Um, there are, you know, differences, communication, like those kinds of things. It's worth it. I'm not, and it, it's also good to have his marriage prep, by the way, just to clarify what I said earlier, it should be in marriage prep. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I just don't think it's the most important thing, but as, as we get into it, learning how to listen, I think is a, is a fundamental basic quality of love. And this is actually a quote from Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. He says, he says, love begins with listening first to ourselves and then to our neighbors. And I use this actually when I'm teaching um, internal family systems, because we, we have our own parts. And so when we're listening to our own parts, that's the first step to actually really be able to listen to other people with all their parts. And so before, before we can enter into uh, an, an engagement with somebody else non-defensively, we have to first take care of what's going on inside of us. And then from that place of compassion and clarity, then we can offer that to other people. But listening is, is the, the most important thing. And, uh, you know, in marriage communication stuff, when we're doing that, it's like you might learn how to keep your mouth shut. You know, it's like, oh, you have one mouth and two ears for a reason. It's like, well, yeah, but how many people keep their mouth shut, but their mind is still going crazy mm -hmm. while the other person is talking? While the other person's speaking, you're already thinking about all the reasons they're wrong and what you're going to say as a rebuttal and how they messed up and they didn't tell it. Their, their sense of history is wrong. They didn't get it right. You didn't really say it that way and all these other things. You're, you're thinking over them instead of talking over them. It's no different. It's still not listening. So we have to actually learn how to put a pause on what I want to contribute to this conversation and first to receive what's coming from the other person in this conversation and take it in and, 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 and reflect on it and try to understand it. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, if your wife is, you're in some conflict with your wife, like it's on some level try to dig deep and remember that at some point in your life, you thought this person was respectable and listen, worth listening to. So like maybe right now, that's not what you feel like, mm. but for the sake of at least your history with this person, just try to understand where they might be coming from and, and give them that attention and give them that listening. And then, you know, of course, what you feel and how you think is important and it has to come up too, but it's, it's never going to be both at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And and so um, I guess so that I'm not putting words in, into your um, thoughts or mouth here, I'm, I'm curious. So in, in addition to men's need to understand the opposite sex in this conversation that we're talking about right here, to understand women, um, once we do understand that, uh, um, that, you know, when they're experiencing pain, like you stated, um, that having some sort of um, uh, sympathetic or, or um, res response that that acknowledges that pain that doesn't immediately go to a solution, would you suggest then that men learn to embrace that aspect? Like, so now I understand this, that my wife or my daughter um, or my neighbor and friend, um, you know, presents this issue and, and responds in this way. And so should I actually be working to change my own natural response and dying to myself to better communicate and relate to them? Or, or um, am I interpreting that correctly, I guess? Well, I, I think you can't, it, it's, it's a little of both. So okay. on one hand, we're called to die to self and to put the other person first and, and go to a place where we are not thinking about ourselves first. And on the other hand, we want to be reasonable here. And also kind of, you know, it's kind of like cunning as serpents and innocent as doves in a sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, know thyself. You know, so if it's like, if you can, uh, this is what I usually tell men is, okay, you want to fix the problem. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes, I want to fix right. the problem. Okay. And your wife has a problem. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what if I told you I have the secret manual for how to fix her problem? Give it to me. Okay. I got it for you. Here it comes. Step one, close your mouth. Okay. I'm writing this down. Step one, got it. This is the path to fixing problems. Step two, look her in the eyes. Okay. Step two, look her in the eyes. Step three, really think about what she's saying. Okay. Step four, tell her I'm listening. Okay. Step five, try to put into words what she's thinking. Mm. Okay. Step five. Okay. Okay. But when do we get to the fixing the problem part? <laughs> like you just did it. That's it. Now, yeah. Step six, the problem is solved. You know, and they look mm. at me like, this is crazy. This is not how you fix problems. It's like, no, no, no. You see, you thought you were fixing a man's problem. Yeah. But you married a woman. And so you need to learn how a woman's problems get fixed. You should still fix problems. That's the beauty of being a man. Like you should be fixing problems. But it's like, okay, I'm used to, uh, I build a deck with a certain kind of wood and I've been doing it for 20 years. And I know this is pine and I use this saw and I use this hammer and I just got this brand new wood and it's Ipe from the Amazon jungle. And it's like the hardest wood ever known to man. And I'm going to take my same you know, saw to it and now just broke my saw. So, yeah. Like it's because you're 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 using the wrong tool to fix the problem. It's a different kind of problem. So you should you just have to learn what are the new tools to fix this different kind of problem that you need. So we're still using the same structures of our brains. We're not not being men. Yeah. But we're learning a different language, a different kind of instruction manual that's meant for this particular kind of problem. And that gets a lot of traction. Men love that. They're like, yeah, sign me up. I can step one through five. Got it. I That's can build awesome. this deck. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I the the right tool for the right job, as some people have, have said, you know, it is like, um, yeah, just listening can be it can be hard for men to turn to turn inward. But really, it isn't an act of like same time, like turning towards that person but but really it's their inner world that you're trying to attune yourself to and for men like you said earlier who are outwardly focused and focused on that external world rather than that internal world that can be difficult and that maybe explains why men resist counseling to some extent or psychology is is it's an it's an act of turning inward and and that doesn't come naturally to a man even though it might be very necessary sometimes but I, I want to switch gears real quick, if, if it's okay, uh, kind of moving from the marriage relationship to something that I've noticed in the secular psychology world that I love for your thoughts on. Mm -hmm. And that's this, this gospel of self-care uh, that goes on in the mm -hmm. external world. And I think it comes from, a the, you, you, hear, you hear over and over, like, you know, you need to stop sacrificing yourself for others. You need to stop betraying yourself. You need to stop um, letting people use you. You basically need to cut off anybody in your life who is in any way toxic. You need to spend hours a day, you know, kind of filling your own tank. And in some of the most extreme forms, it, it can become, come across as like very narcissistic, but they say that like, you know, it's really about you, you come first, you come first. Um, other people are secondary at the very, at the very minimum. And but on the other hand, there's like another side to this where there is some truth in this. Like if we don't ever refresh ourselves, if we don't ever renew ourselves, if we don't have some proper boundaries and relationships, it can be very damaging to us. Um, and so I would love for your thoughts just on this general idea of self-care. I say the gospel of self-care because it kind of comes across as a religion among certain people, with its own moral precepts oh, yeah. and stuff. But the point being like, where is that proper boundary for, for Catholics, for Christians? Because we are taught the value of self, self-sacrifice. Um, and yet again, like it can be very damaging if we don't have some limits and boundaries and we don't take care of our own soul and things like that. So, so just your thoughts on that, that whole subject. 
Yeah. So I think, you know, I think the ends are really important here and it gives color to the means and it gives color to the the process. So if we look at, this is uh, something that, um, again, from John Paul too, um, but, and John Crosby writes about this in, in um, his a very small, very approachable book called the personalism of John Paul too. And, you know, he says basically uh, self ownership, self determination is is the glory of our freedom and dignity like that's to to have this kind of and and sometimes even psychology and and knowing thyself and knowing your narratives and unpacking we could like all this navel gazing it can feel like okay that's like really self-centered but it's like well what's what's the purpose of it and if if self-determination if if having freedom of choice is the glory of our dignity and it's what is what is that choice being used for? Because the ultimate glory of our humanity is to become saints, which is to become gifts of self and die to self. So it's this juxtaposition, this this paradox of of a, a gospel, a true gospel call to to die to self. And it means so we have to own ourself fully in order to make a gift of self. Hmm. So there's a bit of this both and happening. So the problem with this the secular culture that doesn't have that second part to look to is like the need for self-determination, the, the dignity that we have is inherent in our experience. Like we all have a sense of needing to be important. And I usually say too, like even if we're dealing with narcissism, it's like, boy, you're kind of not totally wrong. Like you kind of are that great. You know, it's like you should want to defend your greatness and and you should want other people to know how great you are. You are great. You're made in the image of God from every perspective. Right. You're great. You know, and and obviously it's psychopathologically, it's usually a cover up of not feeling like you're great. So that's a little bit of the opposite. But point being. We 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 need to know what to do with that. And and that's where the revelation of Christ becomes so important. And And so we could say. Self-care is rightly seen as self-stewardship, and we're stewarding this gift that God gave us in ourselves for our ultimate end, which is to become a gift of self. And that's how we become saints. And, and with that paradigm, it cuts through and navigates through the mess. And you can, you can avoid leaning too far to uh, the self-denial side which is pathological and, and too far towards the, you know, narcissistic side, which is pathological. And then we can stay on that straight and narrow right through the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Greg, I, I really appreciate that. I think there's just been so much great topics that we brought up here. So practically speaking, what, what do you think is, um, one of the biggest hurdles that men um, are struggling with today as it as it relates to communicating with other people and, and relating with other people. There's a lot of noise in the world. And I want to give you an opportunity to uh, kind of speak to the heart of men and what we can be doing to um, order things according to God's plan for our lives, for those that we come in contact with. And uh, yeah, just give you the floor and the platform there. And I know we can't speak to every individual nuanced situation, but just, you know, generally speaking. Well, oh boy, I, I would say, I'd say, you know, what, what is the, the, I see in the younger generations are disillusioned because of being fed lies and inheriting garbage. And I, and I'm saying that in and outside the church, Mm. Um, you know, in the imperfections of the human manifestations of our church. And I think that uh, number one is just a, a call to not give up and, and not give up hope and, yeah. and the seeking of, of truth and goodness and beauty in an objective sense in the, in the magisterium of the church and to, to be unafraid to submit themselves to the beauty of Holy Mother Church. And at the same time, not be afraid of complaining and uh, challenging and and criticizing injustice where it is, and and being able to sort of seek for better manifestations of it. But it's holding both together: is to fight for the good of Holy Mother Church 
and at the same time, um, not uh, not accept mediocrity. You know, to not to not give in to this culture of mediocrity, and and so it takes a lot. And I would say number one in that fight, if you can philosophically hold that uh, plan of life and mission is to then practically say, it has to start with my own conversion. And it always comes back every day to my own conversion. So like, and I was going to say this even before with communication, like it's really hard to earn a woman's trust when you don't know how to communicate with her, even more so when we're just being knuckleheads and not doing things that are trustworthy. Yeah. You know, so like, and so that could be, the basics of like addictions and drinking too much or working too much or neglecting our family or whatever. And it could be the more nuanced things of selfishness and, and temper and, and all sorts of things. It's like every day we can go deeper in our own conversion. That has to be our primary project. And then, you know, and then whatever's left over at the end of the day, using resources of mental resources and time resources to you know, continue growing in in knowledge and understanding of the church and her ways, um, anthropology, how to best be a, a husband and father, reading books that are are lined up in that way. It means disciplining. When, back to conversion is disciplining ourselves to not just ever watch every last episode of the Netflix series yeah. that we love, and you know, it's it, it's it's doable to to actually be heroes in this culture, and I think the more that the culture is kind of going down the toilet, it's actually easier and easier to, to be heroes that stand out against this, uh, you know, background. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I, I love all of that. And uh, the one, one thing I wanted to say that's building off of what you said too, is often those moments that are triggering for us, those moments of impatience, those moments of, 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 you know, addiction even, or like, your response, flight from responsibility, where we just avoid, those can often be the doorways that lead us to the places that need healing, to the wounds that need healing. Oh, yeah. And so if we can pay attention to, why did I just get angry in that moment? Yes. Or why did I respond this way when she said this? It can often lead you right to those places where the healing needs to happen. So yes. see those as invitations to... Uh, deeper work or inner work that where God can can begin to bring light to to these wounds that need to be healed, but but that leads me to my my next and final question, which is you have this exciting new uh, form of mental health help for Catholics. Mm-hmm. I think you know as you did, we just discussed earlier, there's this kind of fr- frustration with a lot of the approaches that that modern psychology has offered, or at least even if they may offer something good, they still don't bring in the full Catholic picture of the human person to light. Um, But you're trying to do something about that. You're trying to offer a new way of doing things, um, both for Catholic therapists uh, who are trying to help and for those who are on the other side who are seeking help. So could you tell us a little bit about this, this kind of really new innovative way of uh, bringing help to people uh, who need it? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I I was, you know, in my practice, uh, you know, I'm a, a clinical psychologist. I'm trained in what's called the interpersonal psychodynamic theory and 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 practice from that for a number of years, started incorporating internal family systems. And it just kind of like hit a wall at one point and went through my own little seven-year itch kind of frustration with my work. And I took a bit of a sabbatical and um, you know, just wanted to to really question what I was doing and why I was doing it. And I reformulated uh, kind of a cat. If, if I was to start with Catholic anthropology, how would I actually work with people instead of taking the secular definitions of what working with people is supposed to look like? So I started from the Catholic anthropology instead of just trying to like fold it in somewhere. And I realized, number one, Christ doesn't invite us into his life into a 45 minute session once a week. And in fact, any priest I've ever heard talk about that directly has said the opposite. Don't make your faith one hour a week. You know, it's like interesting, but that's what we're supposed to make mental health work. Mm -hmm. But Christ actually encounters us and walks with us 
where we are. So he goes on the road to Emmaus and he, you know, he shows us what it looks like to meet the woman at the well and to go to the people where they are in their suffering, not standing back in their nice polished office with their waiting room on their schedule saying, come to me. And so I was starting to play with that reality. And then, and then just realizing like I, you know, there's so much that's happening in between sessions during the week that if I was actually there to engage with people on a daily basis, then I think that would be more in line with our anthropology. And again, this is not any disrespect to, I myself am licensed still, and I still, you know, we have a licensed practice and there's, there's a certain level at which this is what the current world situation, state licensure and laws and all these other things require. So we did what we could do, but I, I, you know, wanted to see if there's also another way to do this and, and took this step back and, and reevaluate everything. So it created a new modality of accompaniment that is not less uh, integrated with psychological expertise, but it is not dependent on the structures that come from that secular field. So we work with people on a daily basis. We don't uh, we don't work with insurance. We don't deal with state licensure. We've um, I, I had a team of lawyers actually do all the due diligence and coming up with all the legal language and figuring out what's actually different. We we view the person as bigger than what the field of psychotherapy views a person as, and so we're we're people say like, are you you're not doing psychotherapy? You know, what would you say you're doing? And they say, are you coaching or is this like this is like kind of less than therapy, right? It's like no, no, it's more than therapy. Because we see the person as more than my license would allow me to see the person as. And and what I'm hopefully doing is offering an alternative to other therapists as well, because we've all been in the same boat where it's like, if most of our Catholic therapy, at least where we have Catholic clients and we're doing working with the freedom of of sort of what we really want to say and do in the process of that dynamic was observed by any of these states that hold our licenses they probably would take the license away. <laughs> so <laughs> we're all sort of in this weird middle area of, of like, you know, acknowledging the spiritual life. But then beyond that, it's like, no, we acknowledge God as our creator and the agent of all change. And so if we're in, in our path to happiness is going to be through submission to his holy will, like that's not psychotherapy. You know, so it's like we're all in this balance, so sort of trying to figure out. So, so what we've been able to do is create an infrastructure that's legal and ethical and moral, but it's also, I think, more authentically tapped into Catholic anthropology because this is really who we see the human person as. We don't separate our spiritual life from our emotional life because we're not disintegrated. We're actually unity of, of body and spirit. So uh, it, it it works in a in an interesting way utilizing technology. Um, so we have the an app on the phone that we will use voice messaging, and we'll go back and forth and carry on a dialogue, and it kind of takes on a life of its own within the space of these audio messages back and forth. And it, it, I'll just say this because it's literally every person that ever hears about it for the first time is like, well, that sounds like really impersonal. How can you say that that's more than meeting somebody face to face? But the reality is, and that was my question when I first started this, the reality is you there's nowhere else in your life where you're where you have somebody paying as much attention to you on a daily basis. And when you're walking with somebody who's paying attention to you, giving you their attention every day, it's life changing. And it's, and it's, I, I just finished with somebody after a year and, and that's what they said. The person said, there's nobody else in my, and, and this person is in, in a, over 50. And, and the statement was, I've never in my life before had somebody actually pay attention to me every day for a year. Oh. And, and it was like the most life changing thing that ever happened. So there's, there's all these opportunities that come in from an integration of a, a deep principle of, of our anthropology with the expertise that comes from psychology, but also the expertise that comes from 
our spiritual lives and understanding who we really are and what we're made for. And we can actually be more in touch with and, and closer to people through that kind of principled accompaniment than necessarily fitting into like a CPT code and a diagnostic code. And this is for reimbursement and this is for this and this is for that. So I'm really excited about this because we've been doing this now for th two years. Um, we've been compiling a bunch of outcome uh, survey data. We're putting together some reports uh, for for submitting for peer review into, into different journals. And it's it's mind blowing how much more efficient this is to actually help people while staying faithful to a, a fully integrated Catholic anthropology. So that part is really exciting. And then we're developing now where we just launched a certification program. And so we're going to be teaching other people how to do this and use our model of integration, whether it's in this modality of accompaniment or even in regular psychotherapy, or we have priests in our program that use it for their own you know, spiritual direction or pastoral work or whatever, missionaries that are in the program. Um, but the, the really cool thing is that like most master's programs or doctoral programs, the, the training is going to have a practicum component of it. So we're actually able to offer our mentorship accompaniment at a very affordable fee for, for anybody to get this daily accompaniment, working with our students in our certification program with our supervision, of course. And so not only are we training more people how to do this, but we're making this, the help actually more uh, accessible for people that maybe couldn't even afford regular therapy. So we don't need to rely on the insurance industry when we can actually create an ecosystem that's more affordable in the first place. So it's pretty cool stuff that's happening. And, and um, if people want to hear more about that, they can go to iddmentor.com. And that's where we have some videos and some information about it. Wow. Well, that's honestly just beautiful. I, I congratulations on, on using your God-given uh, creativity, heart for service and, uh, um, and just, yeah, love of, um, of your practice and what you're doing to help um, men and women. Yeah. Congratulations. That sounds, sounds really exciting. So we'll be sure to drop um, notes in the show notes uh, for people to click on links uh, to view more. Also, be sure to share your podcast. And uh, I know you're active on Instagram. Any any place else that people should be um, clicking on to learn more and engage with you more frequently? Uh, no, the Being Human podcast. Uh, that definitely would be fun to check out. Actually, I was thinking about it before because we were talking about the male female dynamic, and I have um, one one of my uh, colleagues, Dr. Brian Violet, and then. We have our director of content, Amy Grace Miller, who the three of us will be on the show like this. And we'll talk about some of these male female dynamics with a, with a woman on the show. Oh, so yeah. Amy Grace's perspective. And so Dr. Brian, even even in communication was like, you know, if I come in the room and I tell my wife, like the room is messy. And then Amy Grace's face just went blank and she was like almost horrified. She's like, what does your wife think? Uh, and then, and then I was like, what is she talking about? The root, all he said was the room is messy. Why is that? <laughs> Why is that a thing? <laughs> and then, you know, so we unpacked this whole thing. So we talk about these dynamics a lot on the oh, being human so podcast. Fun. So it'll probably be interesting for, uh, for some of your listeners. I'm sure. Well, we'll be sure to drop that in there. So Dr. Greg, thank you so very much for your expertise and for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll look forward to uh, future communications and everything. So as we like to end each of our episodes, be a man, be a saint.